happy to have you back to this our show, Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. This happening to be our 301st show, and you are the accumulated viewer that you see below there. And us is only the two from the these days burning gas station, as to quote that, which you, DeSoto, are excited about our cookie mid-century German movies from the 30s and the 50s, named the three from the gas station. Today, it's only us two, you, DeSoto Brown, in your childhood Osipov designed tropical exotic uh, home up the Diamond Hill. Hi. Hello, good morning, and I'm also joined by my dog, as I always am, every everything as tech show. As you are, and the birds. And the birds. And and Martin, only actually, you know, a, a little distance away, wish so, but uh, that's how that close together, things could be different, rather idyllic, almost tuck into our extinct volcano diamond head you are, and I'm a little further away at the edge of the concrete jungle of Waikiki, in the Grand Hotel of it, the Waikiki Grand, which isn't quite as grand as you keep rightly so saying. And uh, I would like to be on the lanai as well, but leaf blowers, lawnmowers, grass trimmers, delivery trucks of food with the AC blasting, buses, you name it. It's such a big noise pollution. We unfortunately can't do that. So we have to put up with this constellation. Let's get the first slide up. Uh, we're missing out on the third one, which is Matt Noblet, who is, um, this show has has been the Danish Boston booster because he's certainly, we know him very, fairly well now. Um, and he's certainly one of the finest uh, people in friendly uh, Ness architects uh, um, in, in the world and is uh, with us in uh, trying to make our islands be more back to compliance with our most beautiful natural environment. So we won't continue too much without him. Let's spend the time today uh, contemplate a little bit more sort of fundamentally the sort of, um, and uh, we we got we got a lot of views uh, uh, because this is a hot topic because this is thinking about what happened to Lahaina and what we can learn from it and how we can move on, and we got several co uh, comments and they range from, I mean the only thing they agree on is that this is not a natural uh, disaster that it's either. Um, indirectly informed by us mankind who is not kind, we men are not kind to nature anymore, so through climate change, and some are there who said we have directly an impact, and they're spreading some conspiracy theories about how this could have all been made up or set up. We want to stay in the tradition to be moderate and sort of be respectful of different opinions, but not get dragged into the extremes on one side or the other one. And But I want to take a chance now to sort of to, uh, to provoke us to be a little bit not fundamentalist, but fundamental and really thinking about what is this all about and thinking about reflecting on your culture, although you also have some of my culture in your genes, but, you know, I'm talking to your Hawaiian genes and i'm speaking on behalf of my german genes so um where does this all go back to maybe you know to start all over is like maybe not to default back to what you had basically taken on from us but you know maybe how it all started and so as obviously i'm not a friend of conspiracy theories but i will share a very weird recent uh and i already did with you and now i will share with everyone a an evolution theory of some weird kind. And it goes back to science because our bodies run on close to 100 Fahrenheit, 40 Celsius, right? That's the blood temperature. But since we are engines and we have heat access, we cannot have that as the ambient temperature around us. We need approximately somewhere in the 70s Fahrenheit, 20 Celsius, not to be bean county. So here comes my theory, and this is, you know, we're respectful of faith, but we're suspicious of religions, both of us, I might say, because they've been doing too much harm. So whoever feels offended now by belonging to which religion, um, you know, forgive us. So whoever created our world, he, she, it, whatever, I'm saying had severe attention deficit disorder, and only wasn't able to focus on doing it right, according to making feel as comfortable, not just year round, but day and night here in Hawaii. And then he, she, it, whatever, lost it and left it up to some minions 
who had to do it under, you know, not ideal circumstances of extremely cold, extremely hot places. And they really worked their butt off and tried their best creating these crazy things as like, you know, preventing a tree from getting a frostbite, having to get kick off its leaves at that time and, and shutting down the water supply. Like I do when I go back to Germany, I turn off here the, the water, right? So it doesn't get flooded and stuff like that. So that being said, uh, DeSoto, um, you know, we basically, uh, that, and that's why we white people, we Howleys are uh, so uh, stressed naturally because, you know, the little minions of the creator left us with, oh, we only got these few months in the summer to get the seeds into the ground, nurture it, and then harvest it, chuck up the logs to keep us from frostbites in the winter time, and then munching in our, you know, in, in our caves on that stuff until it got old, until you know the spring comes, and so the whole thing continues. While you and this is you guys, you audience, you get it. This is highly intentionally overly exaggerated. While you guys uh, just, you know, have the low hanging fruit and you had basically had to reach out because everything grows, not everything at the same time, but always something. So why in the world, you know, did you have to go through any kind of effort? But you got stuck with our means and methods of crazy things like money that you didn't have, of having to own a, a piece of the rock of your rocks. You didn't know that, right? Your royalty, your people didn't know land ownership and you didn't know work. And as you know, for working your butt off the rat race all the time, the gratification is vacation. So we blessed you with that because like the few weeks in the year, you know, we then come to your place and swamp it and want to have nothing but the good times that you used to have. But Sorry for us, you don't have any more because you get, get dragged in that too in that red race and have to work your butt off. And actually, when the ones of us who you know take time off from that 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 red race, you know, you have to do this all the time. Is that totally unfair to say? What do you think? Well, it it uh, let me say too that Hawaiian a traditional Hawaiian culture was not just a. a endless vacation obviously and yes there were a lot of things that people worked for but you're absolutely right in comparison to many other environments in the world the hawaiian islands are as optimal for human existence as pretty much they could possibly be but i do also want to say too that it shows the amazing resilience of human beings that we can survive at north the north pole and we can survive in the hottest deserts so that's why there are way too many of us for the earth to be able to support comfortably because we are adaptable and we can exploit the environment. Nonetheless, you're absolutely right that we are living in, again, the optimal conditions for human survival. And when we say that, the important thing is our buildings should reflect that. And that's something you and I just talk about constantly here on, on Human Humane Architecture. So when we are talking about Lahaina specifically and the rebirth of Lahaina that we're going to look forward to, there are various things that need to be taken into account. One, the redevelopment of things that are not going to burn again the way they did. So that means using new materials. It also means trying to reduce our fossil fuel use by how we build and what we live in and where we work. Uh, it means the consideration of moving back from the shoreline as the ocean levels rise, because that's inevitably going on. But something else I just want to pull in because I'm a historian is I would like to also think about what was Lahaina traditionally, what was its environment like when Hawaiians were living there? And there was a whole waterway system that was there. And you just talked about keeping yourself alive. Well, Hawaiians primarily kept themselves alive by growing kalo or taro, and that grows in water. There was a whole waterway system, a natural system which Hawaiians altered to their benefit, which was used for growing kalo. And it was also a place that was renowned for its groves of ulu trees, breadfruit trees, which again were watered by the natural runoff from the mountains, which has long since been interrupted. So in the rebirth of Lahaina, the restoration of the wetlands is something that other people have already discussed. 
plus the restoration of the ulu groves because breadfruit is a fruit that's edible and it's something that you just mentioned we instead of adopting a western culture in which everything is shipped over the ocean to us for us to create more of our own natural environment output of food is also something desirable and ulu is a food so those two things to bring back the way the traditional hawaiians used the land and lived on the land of lahaina is something to keep in mind as we talk about where is lahaina going to go and how is it going to literally return from the ashes yeah uh, right on and and only ultimately it it will also lead to shelter right yeah but again sheltering from mild temperature from warm rain from harsh sun yes takes a lot less than you know your ancestors your hawaiian side it took a lot less material and effort than my ancestors because yours was roof architecture mine is a roof but wall thick walls a cave right so why superimposing that too much effort over your culture which uh, the predominant architecture has been doing on the island, right? And I just bumped into, it, it's like a, my 10th anniversary, actually my 11th year here. And so I just bumped into a team member by accident or intentionally the other day who was working on when I just came here, came from a moderately German temperate climate, went to a way more extreme in the American prairie, move on to the hot desert of Arizona to finally come here. I really know. I mean, when you guys say it's too cold, I said, no, you don't get a frostbite. When you say it's too warm, and I know I'm not here over the summers, I have to take that criticism. But I look up the temperature and I, I got heat waves over there just be before I came back. We had it hotter there than here. So not why would we basically then build to the standards of the extremes that we don't have here? You know, and, and that's the point. And so this was the age home. So I was asked, go figure why, uh, why me and, and the team, uh, you know, to think about how Hawaiians should live differently than DHHL is doing. And I'm looking at this, you know, looking back, I would do it much different uh, these days, but that was in the beginning and we didn't know any better. But what we tried to do, and the criticism is, okay, what's supposed to be on the homestead land, DHHL, a 99 year lease for nominal $1, which is great. What is not great is then you get ripped off as a Hawaiian by having to buy a termite food and we heard, found out the heart and the two hot way uh, um, a fire combustible is like built like matches, right? Matches that you light up candles are engineered to catch fire from all sides. And that's how stick frame construction basically is, right? And we try to do better. And this is a concrete frame and, uh, you know, it, it has... A, a multitude of things and but i think what what we we were we didn't get any further to say okay if they if they rip people off if they excuse me if they burden them with a mortgage for a lifetime then don't rip them off but give them something you know val worth their money that was the point um and uh but that's how far it went and then you taught me about the recent endorser who we see up there in, in the big picture, who, because in my office, uh, which holds on to AC, they just proudly announced they had been repairing the AC. Uh, never mind. I mean, you and I know from our age what a filofax is, a, a, an analog filing, you know, thing that is a, has a leather case, and I keep it in my office because it's grossly molded because it's 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 it's, it's animal skin. So I'm thinking if that happens to this, if I stay in there, that happens to me and my lung and everything. So I reject it. The irony, and thanks to your doc uh, now, um, you know, cheerleading the buddy here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> they are teaming up and saying, and the AC people ironically or tellingly in order to, you know, keep working in there, they open the window, which is not supposed to do. It has a lock, but they unlock the lock and they opened it up. And this guy must have been sneaking in and basically now living in the Hawaiian home. And you told me this funny story, if you can repeat that uh, from your mother who lived uh, for more than uh, or became more than 100 years in that home that you're sitting in. So must have been very healthy because otherwise you don't get older than 100 years. And you told me the funny things about 
uh, the 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 endemic, the indigenous uh, geckos, lizards, and the exotic ones, or maybe they're even invasive, depending on. Share that. My mother. Okay, so in my youth, there were only brown geckos, and those that came in the houses. And there have been a number of geckos that have been introduced over the years, and other types of lizards as well, which we suddenly have this turnover of new ones coming in. So my mother, when I was a child, and this is over 60 years ago, was scared of the brown geckos in the house because she had a fear when she opened her closed curtains, one of them would fall on her head. And that was particularly upsetting to her. And yet, when the green gold dust geckos, which are exotic, were introduced intentionally because they're pretty, uh, and they moved into the house, my mother decided that they were wonderful. So now she wasn't scared of them anymore. Now she loved to see the green ones instead of the brown ones. And she gave the green ones different names that, that lived in different parts of the house and act, happily looked forward to seeing to them and to talking to them and giving them names. So <laughs> I don't want to praise things that are exotic and or invasive in, <laughs> introductions, but my mother did change her mind about geckos once she saw green ones instead of brown ones. Thanks for sharing. And getting back to the human factor here in collaboration with the animal one, this lucky guy here, because of the miniature version that we give him of the age home, does not have to go to the bank and get that lifelong mortgage. And mortgage rates are the highest uh, since 2001 and whatever, right? So you as a Hawaiian get, get locked uh, into for a lifetime into a Western thing, which is money and borrowing money and paying it off and having to have multiple jobs. And if we get to the next slide, because that's the background of what we shared last time, the cargo courtyard cabanas basically say free Hawaiians from that. And in many ways, it's a homework that, you know, because we were charged with, or we were shot with the five bullets as I call it by DHHL and three of them war with B, there were bugs, burglars, and budget. And so in many ways, using cargo steel is an answer to that one with a raw construction cost of whatever the market price of the ship and there is was $3,000 at that time. So this is our point. Why don't you hopefully get compensated now by your insurance, by whoever, the government, rightly so, but then rather to getting back locked in the same thing, why don't you maybe then, you know, do something like this? And with the rest, you can continue or reconnect to live a life that you're rightly so used to, which was a, which was a conducive of the climate and culture life here and not that sort of in slavery, Western kind of lifestyle. And, you know, I'm speaking of, you know, the VW 181, the thing that comes out of the darkest days of my culture. This was a Hitler initiated car, right? But you, through we say through its simple anatomy, it was able to convert, flip from the evil to the positive when the hippie generations have adopted it. And that's the idea you just mentioned. We 90% we rely on shipping things in. So the shipping container is equally not just as bad, but bad enough, a symbol of dependency, right, of something bad. We flip this, make it a, make it a symbol of self-sufficiency again, of freedom, of decolonization, if you want so. And to the left, we got what we indicated last time. This is now the images going with, this is what they do. And we assume they mean well again, they want to help. But do they do, they do it right? You're living in a box. Uh, this is probably, you know, not what, not even animals you want to box in. The, the gecko wants to live in the age home. It was going through the window to move in, right? So it wants an open, easy, breezy lifestyle. Who wants that? I think it's, sorry, kind of an insult for Hawaiians who are blessed with the best of circumstances climatically and shove them into a box with a window. That works in the, for the places where I grew up in Germany, in Nebraska, you know, in the desert, maybe even to keep you, to keep you cool because it's so damn hot. But here, really, sort of, again, I, 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 I give them all best intentions, but then, you know, the results matter. And I'm, I'm sort of unsure about that increasingly when I see that. I don't know how you think about it. Well, I think, you know, the, the, the temporary housing is temporary housing. 
but you and I, and you've, you've enlightened me a great deal on building materials and things that are innovative, that I think this is the time for Lahaina to think in terms of innovation and new materials that can fulfill what you and I have just been talking about. And we've talked about aerated concrete, which is not as hot, it doesn't retain as much heat, it is not flammable, it's not going to burn, it can be turned into building materials that are actually more easy to use yeah. than traditional cement or concrete. And then also just the, the very basic concept of, let's say that every new building in Lahaina from now on has to have a white roof to reflect the cruel sun, which is the name Lahaina, the traditional Hawaiian name means cruel sun. It means yeah. it's hot there. Let's yeah. adopt what we can use that's new and modern and different to yeah. take care of the things that you've just been saying. And share another one of these materials that you got totally excited about, which I brought you a sample. Yeah, so then there's this other, this other go, stuff, which go is... To, and go to the next slide for that okay. reason, because we might want to make clear, I mean, Matt already said, it's not as easy to say, oh, throw up a tent and this is it. It's not meant that literally, not any of these suggestions are meant to be the solution, by the way. I'm highly allergic to that as well from cultural baggage because Hitler said the end lösung, the final solution, which was the most inhuman and humane. So I'm very sensitive when people come and throw out and say, oh, I got the solution. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm also very sensitive when people say I'm the Führer. I know I'm the only one who knows. I'm very, because of obvious reasons, very sensitive to these things. So it's not, and Matt already said it as being the hybrid of the German company he works for and the American he is. But as we say, a tent recognizes primarily to be sheltered from the rain and the sun, it does. But this one here, the pavilion lets the breeze fill. And this is, this is one of the many you know, products we're not selling, we're not making profit, we're not teamed up with any industry. Not at all. We, you know, we we just point out in several directions, and so this is this is one company I got introduced to through my sister because the one at the bottom there in the middle is hers, and you know it has these sides that you can close down that you might want to do in the in the evening when you need more privacy when you need more security, but in the, when the sun is out there again and the and the wind you know and the wind has to cool you you roll it up again. And, you know, we have an ongoing thing comparing automobiles and architecture. We see our PIing mobile up there, right? That is doing that. It has a convertible soft top that I put up when it rains or when it's actually too hot. But when I drive in the evening, I take it down, right? On overcast days, I take it down and uh, get us to the next slide. When it kindly stays with you, it we see at the top there, I throw a car cover on. So we can learn from that for architecture, right? That you basically have a kind of biomorphous way of changing according. And Western architecture, invasive, important one, does not do that. It's always the same, right? It is not adaptable. And your traditional uh, structures did that. So here we see you in front of your lava rock uh, childhood home that you're sitting in and broadcasting from. And being excited, what I brought from you from this German company, uh, thanks to um, uh, Karsten Kleine here and his uh, his his staff uh, from the company Siltex. And what did we bring you in the good tradition of your of your royals, who also did the same thing? They went to see us guys and brought back goodies from all over the world. Which is this one that gets you so excited to okay, share in the three and a half minutes left we have? You brought me a woven kind of a cord or a, a wider band. And it is interesting because it's flexible and you can you pull it and let it come back and pull it, let it come back. Well, it's not just that, but it is made, the threads, the fiber is made from basalt in a process that is mysterious to me, but that doesn't matter. The technology exists. Basalt is what the islands of the Hawaiian islands are made of, lava. And lava can be essentially turned into a building material, not just as rocks, but it can be turned into this fiber, which is, again, flexible. That's astonishing to me. But the wonderful thing is, and I took this to work and asked people what the, if they could guess what the heck this, this substance was. And nobody could, obviously, because basalt is a rock and this is a flexible fiber. 
Well, the point is, again, it's a technological innovation and there is a huge supply of basalt in the world that the earth creates on its own. We're not creating something new, we are reusing it. And this is again, a way to think outside the box of a new type of technology. So if we're, if we're saying that we're gonna use tent-like structures, and that doesn't necessarily mean a tent, it means fabric or some kind of flexible thing that you put over some kind of a framework, which could be this type of cord, this woven cord, because the yeah. company you went to makes woven things of different substances, including basalt. So yeah. we don't necessarily Let's go to the need... next slide to illustrate okay. this more, how this could be as my favorite of your lectures, your stories is the evolution of the tradition of innovation, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. So, so here here's... The... And you and Matt and I in Bishop Museum visiting me um, in front of the Holly Pili, the grass house. And this is the only surviving real Hawaiian grass house still in existence today, although it, of course it has been rethatched. And there's the stuff that we're talking about. There's that flexible basalt cord. There's the basalt itself, yet it turns into that flexible stuff. And that is almost magical. But again, yeah. that's innovation that we can talk about to we are, and, and in these photographs we're using a very we're looking at a very traditional Hawaiian structure from ancient times and then in front of it we're looking at this modern material that can be used just as as innovatively as we want it to be particularly when we're talking about rebuilding Lahaina exactly and that's what your kings have been doing that traveled the world actually to save their kingdom and we're lobbying for it and brought back again electric light for the palace that's also a very you know i mean it, it is an i would say a tropical exotic and not invasive because it has a lot of lanai's around it that keeps it cool and he brought back electric light the light bulb he talked thomas edison into giving it to him before the other palace in washington dc the white house right so that being said, and we have only 20 seconds left, uh, Carson Klein says hi, and we uh, shared that with him. And we said, hey, why don't we maybe thinking in uh, developing a, a, an enclosure uh, of these days out of uh, the basalt uh, weaving here? And he said, interesting. So that's, you know, where, and again, this is not the solution. That is not the thing that we say one thing, you know, for everything, um, um, and this is just one of the many more ideas that we're going to share when we come back next week with Matt, who is now in a train to New York City and then flies to Munich. So um, hopefully we have him back for continuing next week. And until then, please stay tropical exotic, exotically tropical. Bye-bye.